Welcome to Module 4. In this video, we're going to be following Chapter 17 in OpenStax Astronomy and thinking about all of the different things that we can learn about a star from receiving its starlight. We are going to be building off of a lot of the understanding that we originally laid out in Chapter 5 from OpenStax Astronomy that we covered in a Module 3 video. So let's get started. Now, the sun is the brightest star in our sky. It defines daytime and nighttime, whether it's above the horizon or below. Other things that appear very bright in our sky are solar system objects. The full moon is very eye-catching when it's in the sky. Venus and Jupiter are often uh, thought of accidentally as UFOs because they are so bright near the horizon when they are first rising or starting to set. And even Mars, um, at its brightest, can look quite, um, quite beautiful in our sky. So if we think about all of these solar system objects, especially the planets that are not making their own light, we start to recognize that we're talking about a brightness that is um, based on our perspective, not on some true, actual brightness that these objects have. So we're going to start to distinguish two types of brightnesses. Um, and we're going to introduce a scale, a unit, that is used by astronomers for brightness that's a little weird. Um, so the unit is a magnitude, and it is used for apparent brightness. So here we have apparent magnitudes. It is also used for absolute brightness, so we can also look up absolute magnitudes. Now if we look at this scale, we'll see that on the left, where the brightest things are, like the sun, we see big negative numbers. And the dimmest things, including dimmer than the Hubble telescope can even see, have big positive numbers. So this scale works a little bit backwards, and that's worth putting into our notes and kind of having in our head somewhere if we start to use it on a project or a lab. The scale is based on ancient Greek scholar Hipparchos and his catalogs. He had different categories of stars, and the best and brightest stars in our sky were category one. Number one, they're the best. And the next brightest set of stars were category two, and he had six total categories. Modern astronomy has, hide, has tried to kind of hold true to that goal, but there were a couple of issues. So first, because Hipparchos ended at category 6, we have made sure that the scale matches that a magnitude of 6 is the faintest thing our eyes can see. There are fainter objects, but Hipparchos would not have known about them. But then when trying to fit the scale for bright objects in our sky at the highest end, a lot of these category 1 things were drastically different brightnesses compared to each other. So, for example, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, was so much brighter than the star Betelgeuse, which was also considered a Category 1 star, that modern astronomy had to disentangle them and separate them out. And if we're already got um, smaller numbers is better, we have to go to zero and then to negative numbers. So that's what we got stuck with. Sirius is minus 2 in magnitude, and then the Sun, the brightest star in our sky, is minus 26 in magnitude. Quite impressive. Now, um, besides this magnitude scale working backwards, it also is this kind of inherently complex scale to work with mathematically for um, our introductory astronomy because um, going from a 1 to a 2 is not doubling the brightness. It's more complicated than that. We're going to be seeing these magnitude numbers, but we're not going to work too closely with them um, when we can avoid it. So apparent magnitude is there to distinguish from a different type of brightness, so let's introduce that now. We have to make a really important distinction between apparent brightness, how bright something looks to us, from absolute brightness. So let's imagine that I had a 100 watt light bulb that I um, had plugged into a lamp and I was holding it right up to um, your face. It would be really bright and almost blinding and you would ask me to stop. That same 100 watt light bulb, if I went all the way down to the other end of a hallway and held it up, you'd be like, eh, yeah, that's a light bulb, but it's not very impressive. The light bulb has a true brightness, an absolute brightness, that is that 100 watts written on it. We went to the store and purchased a specific brightness we wanted. But depending on how close we were standing to it, we viewed that brightness differently, and that's apparent brightness. Now, the difference between these two 
is a, um, an equation called the inverse square law, which describes the fact that if we walk away, um, if we go twice as far from an object, we don't see um, one half, we don't see uh, a factor of two decrease, we see one fourth or a factor of four decrease because two squared is four. If we go three times farther away, three squared is nine, we see one ninth the brightness that we originally started with. And that's what this image is trying to indicate. Um, and when this shows up, we'll, we'll be working with it together in lab. But I wanna make sure that we understand that the important thing for us is that distance plays a really big role in apparent brightness. It is more important um, in how we view things than um, the true brightness. Now, the true brightness, the absolute brightness, that 100 watt written on the light bulb, is also referred to as luminosity. And that's gonna be a term that we will be working with a lot more often because luminosity is a way for us to work with these brightness ideas without using the magnitude scale. So luminosity is a power that the star has. It's an energy generation rate over time. And it is based on two key ideas. The 4 pi r squared is one of the key ideas. 4 pi r squared is how we describe the surface area of a sphere. So the luminosity cares about the surface area of the star. Bigger stars tend to be brighter stars. And then the other factor is the energy flux from black body radiation. And that's the sigma t to the fourth, where sigma is a constant that we can look up. We're not even gonna put it on the slide. And the temperature is to the fourth power. So if something is twice as bright, uh, sorry, twice as hot, um, it will be two times two times two times two. It will be 16 times more luminous if it is twice as hot. So hotter stars tend to be brighter. Now, when we get into complex ideas like we can have a cold big star or a small hot star, we would have to rely on this equation and thinking about just how much brighter or how much larger. But for now, if all else is equal, bigger is brighter. And if all else is equal, hotter is also brighter. All right. Now, we want to think a little bit about temperature and color. In module three, we discussed Wien's law, where the peak wavelength that we receive from the black body radiation curve, that um, spectral curve, is based entirely on the star's temperature. We had this color scale um, that we see now at the bottom of the slide. We saw that in a previous slide in module three, where cooler stars tend to look reddish or red-orange, hotter stars tend to look blue or blue-white, and when we look at this image here, where the colors have been kind of enhanced a little bit um, with, with Photoshop, although they are not fake colors, we can see that these really do show up when we have good viewing conditions, they really do show up as being visibly different. In the um, Orion constellation, Betelgeuse looks very red, Rigel looks very blue when you have really good sky conditions. So an easy way to kind of see that. Astronomers can be a lot more specific than thinking about reddish and bluish by using a color index. And that is described in our textbook, but it goes beyond the level of depth that we need for our introductory astronomy course. So I welcome you to uh, look into that more if you're interested. There are several different color indices that are number values describing the relative intensities at two different parts of the spectrum. We don't really need it. It's not even in our vocabulary. It's not a bolded glossary term. But we do want to recognize that astronomers are able to be very specific about color in a way that we're not trying to be in this course. Okay, let's move on from color. One of the other things that um, a spectrum can tell us is those spectral lines. And back in module three, we were talking about how those spectral lines tell us what the star is made out of. And we also learned about Doppler shift and the Doppler effect for a star physically moving towards us or moving away from us. The cool thing is, is when we have good enough data from a star, we can actually tell about a star's rotation rate because of how thin or wide those spectral lines end up being. 
if a star is rotating and rotating relative to us, so in the image on the screen, we would be at the bottom of the screen looking up. But for the camera here, if um, the star is rotating one side, so this hand is moving towards the camera, towards you, you would see part of that light blue shifted, and this hand would be moving away from you, you'd see part of that light red shifted. And that would continue to be true. So the um, spectral line is kind of split among stuff that is slightly too red, slightly too blue, and in the middle, and it gets wider and shallower in a way that astronomers can then piece together what that rotation rate looks like. So a way to use the skills we already have. Now, the other big thing about paying attention to the spectral lines is um, a discovery made by uh, Wilhelmina Fleming and Annie Jump Cannon especially out of the group of women called the Harvard Computers that certain stars seem to have specific patterns different than other stars. So let's take a step back briefly in time. The sun's spectral lines were first identified and recorded and published in 1814 a small handful of very clear, distinct lines in the sun's absorption spectrum. By the end of the 1800s, not only did we have these spectral lines for the sun, but we had it for a wide variety of other bright stars. And um, we had started to categorize stars based on which lines were more prominent, which ones were missing, and we kind of categorized them into different um, bins, into different types. So this work was being done primarily by the Harvard Computers, the nickname for the group of women who um, at the time were not allowed to get PhDs, um, but were allowed to do all of the difficult uh, analysis that the men astronomers didn't want to do. So they were the ones really making some of these breakthrough uh, analyses, uh, and it is only recently that history has started to remember their names and their contributions. So Wilhelmina Fleming originally put these different categories, just started with the beginning of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, all the way down to um, O and P, because all she had, Wilhelmina Fleming, started with just the spectral lines themselves, no temperature information. So that project um, got put in place. And then several years later, Annie Jump Cannon took over that project and was given stars um, that also had follow-up information for their spectral curve to get that peak wavelength that we need for Wien's law to be able to determine the temperature. So then she took the categories that Wilhelmina Fleming had um, created and arranged them by temperature. And in doing so, she had to combine some categories, uh, certainly rearrange the order of the alphabet. And so what we end up with is the product of these, um, these two women working on this project over time, um, and we keep these in order to kind of preserve that legacy. So the uh, numbers, or the sorry, the letters in order are O, B, A, F, G, K, M. You can see on the left some of these numbers attached to it to tell you where in the category it is. Those are spectral types. And you can start to see different patterns. So for example, in the, um, in the dark blue, A and B stars, which were next to each other in the original order, do seem to have a lot in common for which lines are present and which ones are missing. But F also seems to have some of these lines, especially in the blue and the teal, that continue down until they fade away by the time we get to G and K stars. Uh, and so you can start to see some of the patterns that maybe Wilhelmina Fleming was originally picking up on. When we look at these types of stars, we want to recognize a couple of things. First, this class is not about memorization, but we are going to often refer to the outside um, ends as shorthand for really hot stars or really cold stars. So we want to recognize that O stars, the letter O, O stars are the hottest, brightest stars on the main sequence. We'll be learning about that term in just a little bit. And M stars are the coldest stars. And when we're talking about stars living their normal lifetime, they are also the smallest. The sun is kind of right in the middle. It's a G2 star. So it is one of these kind of middling temperatures. 
uh, and it has certain features that we do see for our own sun. Our sun is just a typical star in its category, in its spectral type. Now, these stars here shown with color and size are all comparing stars that are currently turning hydrogen into helium in their course through fusion. We learned about fusion quite recently. These are all stars that are living the normal part of their lifetimes because there are other types of stars, other types of um, stellar objects that we aren't going to be um, comparing when we have these the size information too. Now, OBAFGKM, these uh, letters lasted for a uh, hundred years and every new discovery could be put into one of these bins. But I want you to stop and think for a little bit, reflect on what we've been learning in this module, reflect on what we were learning in the last module, all of these tools that astronomers have. If we needed to define brand new categories, where would it be most likely that we're finding new objects? If you need some direction, think about, is it likely that it would be objects that are hotter and bigger than O stars? Would it be objects that are colder and smaller than M stars? Or would we have to find something in the middle that we just haven't um, properly identified? So think through that question for a little bit, decide where new categories would most likely be needed. All right. I hope that some of the things you kind of pulled in your critical thinking um, include the fact that a bright thing is easy to see and um, that as we build better and better telescopes, we're able to see dimmer and dimmer objects. So it is unlikely that we have somehow missed a category of star that is even more impressive, hotter and brighter than the stars we already have. And instead, as our technology improves and improves over time, we are looking for things that are much smaller, smaller than M stars and colder than M stars. And indeed, objects colder than M stars were discovered initially in 2009, and a lot more have been discovered since then. But they are so cold that they cannot turn hydrogen all the way into helium, like we learned that the sun does in its core. So we can't call them stars. They are an object that is this kind of in-between area between a star and a planet. So it is at this moment in time that we can kind of fully describe the difference, truly describe the difference between stars and planets. Stars can and do turn hydrogen into helium in their cores for most of their lifetime. Planets have no fusion at all in their cores. The Earth is not going through any fusion in its core. Jupiter is not going through fusion in its core. But in between these two extremes, there is an object called a brown dwarf that can do the very first step of the proton-proton chain. Two hydrogen get fused together to make deuterium, a form of hydrogen. That still gives off some energy, so these, these objects are able to kind of power themselves a little bit, but they don't go through the whole process and that doesn't um, make them very bright. So planets and exoplanets um, are uh, Jupiter sized. They can get up to about 13 times the mass of Jupiter and then they have too much mass. That'll start to turn on the first stage of fusion and we get a brown dwarf. Brown dwarfs are that middle ground between a planet and a star they'll be between 13 to 80 times Jupiter's mass, and then a star would have to be at least 80 times the mass of Jupiter to have enough mass to have fusion in the core, turn hydrogen all the way to helium. So these definitions are really purely based on the structure in their cores, how hot and how dense those cores are in order to allow fusion or um, not permit fusion at all. So that's where we're gonna leave off for this video. In the next video, we're gonna be talking about ways that we kind of analyze all of these different pieces of information and, and really start to learn more about um, stars and the types of stars beyond the fact that there are stars and non-stars. So, and we'll see you in the next video as we continue discussing the family of stars. Thanks for watching.